Welcome to UO Today. I'm Paul Peppis, sitting in for Barbara Altman. Our guest today is Jennifer Burns Levin, literature instructor in the Clark Honors College. Her teaching and research focuses on 19th and 20th century British and American literature, Anglo-American modernism, sexuality studies, food studies, and James Joyce. Levin's recent work considers the way modernist writers struggled with and theorized their fleshly desires, often in opposition to the medical profession and obscenity laws. Her first book-length manuscript is titled Lower Discipline, The Many Masochisms of Modernism, 1870 to 1930. A second book project, tentatively titled Hunger Artists, Appetite and Consumption in Modern Literature, tackles the myth of the starving artist in Anglo-American lit. Levin leads the Food in the Field Research Interest Group, sponsored by the UO Center for the Study of Women in Society. She writes, speaks, and teaches in the Eugene community about local cuisine and sustainable food practices. She is certified as a master food preserver and is a co-host of Food for Thought, a radio show on KLCC in Eugene. Levin's award-winning food blog, Culinaria Eugenius, documents gastronomical adventures in Eugene and the Willamette Valley. Jennifer, welcome to UO Today. Thank you Thank so you much. for taking the time to talk with us. Very good to be here. Um, you began your academic journey some years ago, focused on Thanks, Japanese <laughs> and English lit. Why did you turn to Anglo-American modernism as a graduate student? How did you move from studying Japanese lit to studying modernism? I know it's, it's a curious trajectory, and um, I get, that, get asked that a lot, especially when I go back and I talk about um, Japanese literature, or teach little bits of Japanese literature here and there in the Honors College. Um, I started studying it, uh, I'm sorry, I got a degree um, in Japanese and English, uh, both uh, at Berkeley, and I really loved the fact that I could spend, um, devote lots of my time to studying uh, another language. Um, I'd studied French coming up through, you know, grade school all the way into college, and then with Japanese, um, it was a way to do something that was completely different, and uh, back in those good old days, that was the time when the Pacific Rim <laughs> trade was booming and um, the economy was great, so um, I had actually planned to go on. I, I'd actually um, uh, accepted a, a, pro a graduate program at Stanford, um, and I was planning to go on in Japanese studies. But then when I arrived in Tokyo, I lived there for um, a year after I finished my degree, I realized that it wasn't really the right fit for me, so um, I uh, decided to do something else. And that was not at all um, modern um, modernist studies or English lit or anything like that. I actually worked for the Jewish Museum in San Francisco huh. as they were um, uh, undergoing their capital campaign for the, the building renovation that's now completed and uh, kitty corner to the MoMA in San Francisco. Um, but only when we moved to Connecticut, because my husband got a uh, postdoc there, was I kind of at a loss for things to do. So I thought, oh, I'll just go back and get a master's <laughs> in English. And uh, I did that. Um, the very first class was an Irish lit class with Lee Jacobus. Studied Yeats, then studied Joyce. And I knew um, that it was something that I wanted to study for a long time. So that's how it, it began. Hmm, that's an interesting story. So uh, what, tell us what the modernist movement was and why it's still worthy of serious study. Oh, that's a really hard question. Oh, a tough one. Okay, from a modernist <laughs> uh, study scholar. So here's my, uh, my interview question. Um, so modernism, um, there's been a lot of, of confusion about um, what modernist means lately. I'm actually working on an article that is looking at those large volumes, modernist cuisine. It's a six volume set um, produced by Nathan Miravold, who had ties to Microsoft. And um, he basically equates this idea of modernism with uh, modernity, um, something that goes from, say, the 18th century to the present. It's all about, you know, the latest things, you know, being contemporary, um, uh, considering science and technology and all these types of things. My definition's a little bit more narrow than that. I mean, I look at it as a, a historical moment that had many, um, many uh, threads and many avenues. So it's a movement that happened um, uh, in avant-garde circles in both uh, in uh, Western Europe and in, uh, in America in different ways. Um, it was largely um, urban-centered. It was a, a movement that um, encouraged uh, individuality and experimentation and um, 
kind of the the uh, bringing the interior outward, so uh, stream of consciousness and those types of things um, that would uh, allow different kinds of creativity. I mean, you can you could really argue that any period is um, experimental in its own way, but with modernism, and I'm going to give the the years for modern for modernism um, as I see it as roughly say 1890ish to I don't know, say mid-century um, in the 20th century, with modernism, that's when you saw all of the um, the uh, creative flourishing of abstract forms and um, and things like cubism and expressionism and impressionism and all these things that kind of just um, uh, played with reality in in interesting psychological ways. So, m much of your scholarship has focused on the great Irish modernist James Joyce. How does he fit into that story, in your view? How does he fit in? Oh, in all kinds of ways. I mean, to me, um, Joyce is, is the, um, in, I think he's a prototypical modernist. Um, he's someone who uh, was a city boy. He moved from city to city. He's pan-European. I mean, he really went from place to place in Europe. So he was able to bring in um, multiple languages and multiple cultures into his writing, but still keep it very um, place-based in Dublin, which is where he was from. So it was kind of like reimagining um, the the story of uh, um, of one's of youth and, and one's growth. So uh, buildings from you know something where uh, it shows kind of the, the growth of a, a particular character. Um, he used a lot of stream of consciousness. Um, he used a lot of what people would consider um, nonsensical phrases, ungrammatical things, um, images that are, are very strong and bizarre, um, kind of hallucinations in his writing. Um, and then he played with language in a way that was unique to anything. Um, I mean, the, r the real reason why I started studying Joyce um, in depth was because you could make more out of a sentence than you could in many writers a page or an entire story. So um, what he does with, with putting words together, putting sentences together in strange ways, opposing you know, different uh, lines of thought, um, and, uh, and weaving words and, and grammar into his, his writing is just um, unlike anything else. So he fits in because of that experimentation, because he's there in a certain time and place, and um, because he um, also has kind of um, some of the negative things that are often associated with modernism <laughs> that I do, by the way, see in that Modernist Cuisine volume. Um, he's known a little bit as an elitist. I mean, he was someone who didn't really mingle with his peers um, very nicely, didn't play nicely with others. Um, and he, uh, you know, had some blindnesses in terms of, of race and, and, and certain social uh, justice aspects. That said, though, I mean, I would defend him to the death because he also does the opposite. Um, he's also, uh, you know, very um, politically um, uh, generous and savvy and uh, really attending to the, the um, uh, conditions and the working conditions of the Dublin poor in his writing. So that's how he fits in. Very complicated and wonderful. So. Joyce's Ulysses is often called the greatest modernist novel and even the greatest novel of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. But between 1921 and 1933, it was banned in the U.S. Mm -hmm. What? Why? Why was it banned? Good question. Okay, why was it banned? Well, it was banned because, uh, largely because of a um, an earlier lawsuit um, uh, that happened uh, in 1920, I believe, 1919 or 1920. I think it was 1919 um, when he was. Um, uh, no, sorry, 1920, when he was publishing um, his chapters in Serial in a magazine called The Little Review. It's uh, another aspect of modernist um, writing is that it often came into the public through these little magazines. Um, and uh, they would publish little bits of novels and poems and you know stuff that really wouldn't be able to make it into a larger publication. I mean, certainly not something like the Ladies Home Journal or a newspaper or, um, or anything like that. So um, one of these stories was, um, I'm sorry, one of his chapters of Ulysses um, was about a young girl who was um, sitting on a beach and the protagonist of Ulysses, Leopold Bloom, is watching her from behind some rocks and he's actually masturbating. Um, so that idea of uh, a girl kind of, um, that's arguable, but in a way kind of exhibiting herself and then the protagonist, you know, the hero of the story actually masturbating and doing something that was not um, at all looked upon kindly um, in society then or now. Um, 
uh, was not seen as something that was, was fit for reading, even for that avant-garde artist. So what happened with that trial was they, um, uh, uh, the obscenity laws in the United States were kind of um, complicated and bizarre for, for various reasons. Um, but uh, to, to put it in a, a short form, the post office had the ability to censor materials and to let um, uh, the legal system know that works were that bad works were coming into the country that works that were not fit for for human consumption and so they um, uh, seized these issues of the magazine then they um, put uh, the magazine on trial so Joyce got a lot of publicity from that early um, uh, uh, obscenity trial and uh, in that trial the the magazine owners were actually fined I think it was a hundred dollars and um, uh, it created a big buzz in the community. So that's 1920. 1922, when Ulysses comes out, um, the, uh, the you know, U.S. officials just said, absolutely not, we don't want to have to have this you know, terrible, um, sexually deviant book coming into our, our country. And uh, it was banned then, and for a long time, too. What finally led to that sanction being lifted, do you know? Um, I do, actually. Um, now, let me think about this. There was a, um, I'm trying to remember the year, um, and I know I'm going to get this wrong without looking at papers, um, but there was a big trial, um, and uh, it was, um, uh, it was held in the United States, and the judge um, just d actually read the book, um, which was something that had not happened in a lot of these obscenity trials, and he determined that um, that Ulysses was not obscene, um, that it was, uh, he called it emetic. Um, it makes one feel like they want to throw up because of the depictions of things like going to the bathroom and then the masturbation scene and there were some um, sexual uh, discussions of sexuality that uh, people found offensive. But um, when it was all said and done, um, it made you throw up, not um, be you know, corrupted by its influence. And that was the whole thing with the obscenity laws, is that you had to prove that, you, that these books could corrupt some, someone. Hmm. Um, now, if you think about uh, who would be reading these experimental works, it would be people who are um, in the avant-garde, people who are artists, people who are interested in experimental fiction. Um, however, every single time that these trials came up, um, the person, uh, the, the ideal reader, um, uh, how we would put it, um, was considered a young girl. So um, it was almost like battling for the, um, the uh, uh, virtue uh, and you know, moral condition of, of young girls and all these experimental works. So um, as you can imagine, I mean, that, that really did create um, big debates. And then finally, um, in the 50s, the obscenity law changed in the United States, thanks in part to the Ulysses trial. Hmm. Uh, f everything that you've said so far um, makes clear your expertise in sexuality studies. Can you tell us about the first book project on themes of masochism in modernist literature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, inspired by my study of, of Joyce, uh, I started studying masochism, and it seemed like an interesting way to look at sexuality and look at alternative forms of sexuality, but in a way that wasn't aligned with the whole um, homo-heterosexual divide that we often see. I guess now we're seeing more transgender stuff, but it's still kind of um, along the lines of, of male-female gender stuff um, and uh, sexual orientation. But for masochism, um, it is also considered a pathology. It's something that Joyce, um, uh, a kind of behavior that Joyce uh, engaged in, and then it comes out in, in Ulysses and in some of his other fiction. I would say all, all of his other fiction. So I was interested in um, the way in which it was portrayed in the novel and then the way in which that it was portrayed in other works that I've been reading of the period. And um, so I noticed that uh, it was al always seen as something that was, uh, was really carefully aligned with a character flaw. And I wanted to know why that was. So um, this investigation took me um, all over the place. I went to the Kinsey Institute. I mm -hmm. studied at the British Library, the Wellcome Library in London. Um, and many other places at Cal State Northridge, uh, looking at pornography, looking at um, uh, kind of pseudo-medical tracks, um, thinking about how the health discourses intersected with sexuality, and when it was um, in the 20th century that masochism became something that was allied with 
um, you know, kind of a, 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 of a bad, suspicious criminal character. Mm -hmm. Because one could see it with sadism. You know, you've got that idea of violence and you know, raping someone or attacking someone. But with masochism, um, someone who wanted to, to experience pain and, and suffering, um, it's a curious idea, but it certainly wouldn't hurt anyone other than oneself. So it was strange that it was vilified in such a strong and, um, and uh, aggressive way. It still kind of is. How did, did you, what, did you come up with an account for why that happened at that particular historical moment? Yeah, I think um, it, it started uh, as early as, as 1870, uh, sorry, as 1890. Um, Sahar Masak, who wrote Venus and Furs, he's often seen as a touchstone of, of masochis masochism and ideas about masochism. And um, it, it's uh, Kraft Ebbing in, in 1890 or thereabouts took took Sakhar Masak's name um, for masochism, for the pathology. Mm -hmm. So when it was defined as a pathology in that way and published in a, a big tome called Psychopathia Sexualis, um, it became a uh, particular kind of, um, of character uh, label. And um, I thought that, initially I thought that right away people would take that, look at that, and then they would start doing this kind of, you know, pathological thinking. But it really didn't take place for many decades um, thereafter. And so what I found um, through my studies, I mean, I, I really did look at popular culture sources, and, and, and pornography was really a great way to see, to kind of mm -hmm. track mm -hmm. how these behaviors were being um, discussed in literature or non-literature, as the case may be. <laughs> it's really boring to read a lot of pornography. I'll just, I want to go on the record saying that. <laughs> um, <laughs> it is not fun. <laughs> but. Um, anyway, so the, um, uh, where was I? Oh, so it didn't filter down into the, the British um, uh, public for many years and even longer um, in, in places like Dublin where they had stricter laws. So um, I was uh, kind of uh, baffled and curious um, to, to understand how, um, sexology and how psychology and psycho, um, uh, psychoanalysis really did appear mm. in just kind of British public discourse. Um, and it finally, it through it, there were lending libraries and there were societies that were dedicated to it. Um, they would circulate these materials. Um, finally, you know, they weren't always translated. They were often came in through German. Um, and uh, then the stuff that was more sexually graphic would, of course, circulate in very small circles. So it was hard to, to kind of change the ideas about, um, about sexuality, even to pathologize it. So that's, that's kind of my working idea about that. But as the, the, um, the pathological uh, ideas related to masochism and other kinds of alternative sex sexuality were beginning to kind of uh, bubble up from the, the, the um, you know, the air, uh, the water, I guess I should say. Um, there were more ideas that were older um, about sexual health and this idea of circulation. So if you were to be beaten, you're actually making your circulation, your juices mm. flow um, mm. a little bit better um, or faster, making you more vigorous, those types of things. Those things, you know, really remained um, in the discourse all the way up through, I would say, the 40s or 50s. Mm. So there was always an argument against the pathological um, character model. Um, so it was really interesting to see the kind of the interplay of those things. Hmm. Um, your more recent work concerns the theme of the starving artist in 20th century lit. Can you tell us a little bit about that argument, that account? Uh, yes. Yeah, so this is um, something that I'm just beginning, um, and it's, I mean, honestly, really in its, its initial stages. Um, I think I'm going to focus on the starving artist. Um, I think I'm going to uh, look at works um, say, you know, Kafka is a perfect example of, of someone who writes about uh, the artist and how you starve for your art, but you see it over and over again. You see it in Orwell, you see it in um, Hemingway, you see it um, certainly in Joyce, where um, there seems to be kind of a displacement of, of desires, um, uh, including food desires, um, and then a uh, kind of a um, opposed to a, a scene of feasting or, you know, uh, some kind of bourgeois experience mm -hmm. where the artist kind of succumbs to that. And um, so I'm going to look at, at, at a bunch of different characters that appear in, in, in crucial texts. Um, and I'm not quite sure exactly where I'm going yet with that argument. Um, like I said, it's, it's very beginning. Um, I did uh, work um, 
I wrote an article last year, I'm sorry, a conference um, uh, paper last year for two years ago now for the MLA on um, descriptions of the preparation of cooking and fruit metaphors and vegetables and peelings and things. And so I'm trying to kind of bring that labor aspect into it um, and a little bit more of a, a, a nuanced reading that involves gender. Uh, but I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> uh, you're also uh, very active in the field of food studies. What is the field of food studies? The field of food studies, okay, this is a relatively new um, field. So uh, yes, these are my two areas of, of, of real interest, they're sexuality studies and food studies. Um, and uh, with food studies, it's an interdisciplinary field um, that in incorporates uh, social sciences and humanities. Sciences, of course, but um, I think the way that it's been uh, formulated, it's mostly um, the social science disciplines and humanities. And it involves um, uh, issues like um, food justice and, um, and food politics, but it also involves the way in which cultures think about food and dining and hospitality and, um, and nurturing and those types of, of qualities. Um, also domesticity, which have been largely neglected in critical literature. Tell us about the Food in the Field Research Interest Group here at the U of O. Yes, so um, this is the first year of the, um, the Food in the Field Research Interest Group through um, the Center for the Study of Women in Society. And uh, we've had a fabulous time. Again, it's an interdisciplinary group. Um, I think we're probably up to Gosh, we must be around 50 people now, 40 or 50 people um, representing a couple dozen, maybe three dozen departments. Um, we, at the University of Oregon, we seem to have one or two people in each department who's doing the stuff. So this is absolutely the perfect um, uh, reason to start up a, an interdisciplinary group. We do um, monthly, sometimes semi-monthly talks of research works in progress. And they run, you know, everything from uh, salmon fishing um, with the Karuk uh, tribes in um, southern, uh, I'm sorry, northern California, to um, African American foodways in literature, to um, we're having African fat and salt um, next month, something on Chiapas. Uh, so you know, it's really wonderful uh, work. And um, it's important to note that this, this research group is part of a larger effort to create a food studies program at the University of Oregon. And um, we're just beginning to, to start um, working on that. We have some, um, some grant applications out there and we've been looking for, uh, we've I, th I think successfully received a bunch of matching funds um, to start a program like this. So I really hope that it's gonna go through because there's a lot of interest and lots of interest with students too. I can't tell you how often I get approached by students um, about wanting to take food studies classes. So food studies for you isn't just something that happens in the uh, classroom. You're, uh, um, you have a, a food blog called uh, Culinaria Eugenius, uh -huh. and uh, you're uh, one of the hosts of Food for Thought, the local food uh, radio show. I am. Tell us about those activities, those out in the community activities with food. Sure, I'd be happy to. So um, this is something I'm particularly proud of. Um, it start my blog started uh, as I was writing my dissertation, and I was kind of you know homebound and <laughs> um, looking for ways to relax a little bit. So I started working on food um, at that point and just doing food recipes and writing about food that was local to um, the Willamette Valley and local to the Pacific Northwest because often you see a food blog that is either a little bit more generalized or centered um, you know, in the, on the East Coast um, or San Francisco, a place where you have more access to food. Um, at that point, we didn't have a reliable restaurant review network, so I was doing some restaurant reviews, and um, some of them were very cantankerous, and I think <laughs> they still kind of are. Maybe they're more cantankerous now. Um, but uh, it's been a real pleasure, and um, it's something that I hope to continue to do. Um, I've been traveling so much lately that I, I feel like I haven't really done the local food aspect justice, um, but I try my best um, uh, at that. Then I um, also will, uh, I'm sorry, and I, and I also um, co-host the, the radio show on uh, Eugene's NPR affiliate, KLCC, um, locally produced and um, a whole lot of fun because we can have guests come in. I do that about once every three weeks or so. Um, there's a, a kind of a rotating uh, set of co-hosts. And uh, it's with Ryan Stotes of, um, of Marche and with um, Brian Wiedenfeld, I'm sorry, Boris Wiedenfeld, can't believe I forgot his name, um, who now works for a wine distributor. Um, 
formerly of Sundance. And uh, we, we really have a great time talking to producers, uh, restaurateurs, um, people who are farmers, people who are trying to be farmers, all those types of things. It's an interview and it's a call-in show. So, I mean, I feel like I'm giving back a little bit to the, to the local community when I do those things. Can you tell us what makes the Willamette Valley unique as a culinary region? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's one of my favorite questions. <laughs> I just asked my students um, in my man versus food class yesterday um, what they would do if they had to eat locally. And people were like, oh, potatoes maybe, or you know, I guess we could grow vegetables. I said, no cultivation. Just what would you eat if you just had to eat from the valley? And it's, um, it's an incredibly rich and fertile valley. I mean, we've got things like, you know, just our native berries. I mean, things like huckleberries and salal and Oregon grape and um, uh, salmon berries and those types of things. Very important um, crops for the, the native people who lived around here um, and towards the coast. Um, but in our valley, um, it's got this topsoil layer that is phenomenal um, from the old floods that ran over the rivers. So um, if you live out on River Road, um, I, I know you don't, but if, if, if one lives out in River Road, um, you can grow just about anything in the soil there. You just dig in and put a stick in and it'll grow um, because the soil is so rich. Um, some say that it's the richest in the country. Um, so for growing, it's fantastic. And we've got a slightly acidic soil, so we grow things like blueberries and um, other and artichokes and other crops that need that kind of acid a little bit um, uh, better than others. And a relatively short growing season, but we can still get really good tomatoes and, and beans and things. So um, what's fantastic about the region now, it used to be really um, kind of a, a fertile crescent for um, for uh, vegetable um, production, so uh, pea cannery, uh, corn cannery, not corn, peas and um, other fruits and vegetables, um, a really big, early, important um, source for that, for the whole nation. Then, of course, California kind of took over that um, and took over it with, you know, big, huge jaws that basically changed the food system so altogether. So, Jennifer, I yeah. have to stop you now. Oh. I, I, it's good to stop on the image of Oregon uh, fighting against the big, huge jaws of California. I think it's a great image to end. Thank you very much for speaking with us. Sure, today. my pleasure. Uh, we've been speaking with Jennifer Burns Levin, literature instructor in the Clark Honors College. Her teaching and research interests include modernist literature, James Joyce, sexuality studies, and food studies. Levin writes, speaks, and teaches in the Eugene community about local cuisine and sustainable food practices. She blogs at Culinaria Eugenius. Thank you for watching.